So yeah, I'm Michael, now at Bell Labs, uh, formerly of MDA Software Institute. This uh, is joint work with my former colleagues at MDA Software in Madrid and a couple of nice guys in Portugal. A very high level view of my talk is just, um, uh, this talk is about a program security property called constant time. This is a property that we want our programs to satisfy. And an approach to verify this property which is called selective self-composition, and hopefully you'll understand what that means by the end of this talk. Along with our implementation that's, uh, that uses SMT-based verification of LLVM assembly code and experiments of verifying actual C code implementations of cryptographic libraries and arithmetic libraries. So my, this you know, very high-level stupid picture of what we want to do uh, is to prevent program leakage. So the attacker, in this case, wants to extract secrets uh, by executing computer programs. And for the purposes of this talk, I don't care whether he's executing those programs as a process on a machine that he has access to or right over a service over the network, for instance. These are both uh, environments in which this talk could make sense. So the basic idea of leaking secrets, right? So for this talk, we'll, we'll assume that the attacker calls into uh, some API, some public interface functions, for instance, this public interface function, which takes a number representing some length and returns another number. Uh, the, the implementation of this public interface function calls this copy function, which essentially performs a copy of a secret input buffer to a secret output buffer, which is bounded by a, a secret offset and the given length that was passed into this public interface function. Now, this copy function, it does you know, what you'd expect a buffer copy function to do. It iterates over the indices of the, the buffer to be copied from, from output to input, and so on and so forth. Uh, this particular implementation of this copy function ends up returning an index. And we would say that although the, the secret is not directly leaked, so I'm, I'm considering the secret to be the offset here, highlighted in blue, this program does not directly leak the secret offset, right? It never returns some value which is uh, computed from the secret offset, but it indirectly leaks the secret offset because the attacker, were he to know the implementation of public interface and copy, he could easily figure out just by following the logic of this code that the return value of public interface minus the argument length that he passed into the public interface reveals the secret offset. All he would need to know is what is the source code of this, which is right, a reasonable uh, assumption to make of attackers in many cases. Now, in this case, it's, it's a pretty obvious solution to fix this, right? We just want to cut off this flow of information. So just being completely brutal in this particular example, let's just say that, OK, well, this copy and public interface functions, they now just return void. They can't possibly leak any information, right? So, so that's a fix in some sense. Um, but this program still isn't completely secure. Because besides just learning information about secrets from the return values of this public interface function, an attacker could potentially, with other assumptions of course, could potentially uh, learn secret information by the timing of that operation, right? So he passes in the given argument, length equals 10, and he times how long it takes for this function to return. Now suppose the attacker knows not only a little bit about uh, how this uh, function is implemented, but also a little bit about uh, what processor architecture this will be running on. Right, some information about the machine. He might be able to right, compute an equation for the total time it should take this function to execute based on uh, right, the total time is equal to the number of cache hits times the time it takes for a cache hit on this particular processor plus the number of cache misses times the time it takes for a miss plus some base offset, just as a simple example. Um, Given that he knows the value for the time it takes for a cache miss versus cache hit, etc., he might plug in and solve for h here based on the measured total time and compute that uh, the secret offset is in fact equal to h, which he'll compute to be 5, for instance. Now, maybe this equation is not so simple to compute for a single invocation over a function, especially when you're talking about a service over a network, but perhaps, right, um, given a large enough sample size, he can uh, have some statistical significance and actually. Uh, be able to leak secrets this way. And, and so if we look at why this particular code is broken, how it can leak a secret even though it's not returning any value, well, let's look at the, how this function is written. There's a for loop here that iterates over the, the indices of the buffer, uh, and then there's a branch checking if we're in bounds of the, the part of the buffer that we want copied. So uh, it says if i is greater than or equal offset, or i is less than offset plus length. 
And if we look at how this uh, will be compiled in x86, for instance, it's not important that this is x86, it could be anything. But at the end, we're going to have some comparison and some jump, right? And what the jump is going to do on the machine is to fetch the next instruction. So if we look at what happens in terms of the success of this jump, in, in terms of the loop index i, right, as i equals 0, 1, 2, the jump is going to skip the if branch and go straight to the, to the loop end until i is equal to offset. Right? At this point, this jump will now go inside of the branch, uh, and, and, and the jump, in, in fact, will fail, so we'll just continue to the next instruction. Now, in terms of what's happening with loading the instructions from the cache, we, we expect right, the, the first, maybe not zero, but at least one, two, three, right, the first indices to be cache hits. And finally, when we get to offset, there to be a cache miss because we hadn't branched to that location before. So again, just based on right, timing and what the attacker, and based on the timing, the source code, and, and processor cache cost, uh, the attacker could feasibly here compute uh, the offset just based on the branching behavior of this program. But software engineers, especially people writing security critical code, are pretty aware of this kind of thing. And so, right, my talk is about constant time, but here I'll just talk about an intermediate property to get there called constant path, which I'm not sure if this exists in nature, but this is, we'll just call it that for now. And the idea is that programmers that are writing the secure code, uh, they, they're aware of this kind of attack, and they want to make their code not be able to branch dependent on secret information. So you could rewrite this, this buffer copy code as follows, where in, in the for loop here where you're doing the buffer assignments, you don't conditionally assign based on whether you're in range or not. You do the assignment anyways, but the assignment is ineffective, right, based on this in-range mask variable. And this in-range mask variable is computed based on some bit operations, and that's either going to be all zeros or all ones, depending on if A is less than B, based on this implementation of constant time less than. Right, so now we can look at this code and convince ourselves that it still implements the buffer copy correctly. Uh, and given the assumption that on a given processor, the, the bit operations right, for a given 32-bit or 64-bit architecture, whatever you're on, will be constant time, then we can convince ourselves that right, this code uh, has uh, the path of execution in this code does not depend on the secret. But that's still not the end of the story. This code is still vulnerable to timing attacks. Right? The attacker could still reason about the value of offset based on the, the loads and stores we're doing in this code, even if the path in, is independent of the secret. So in this case, the, the store to out index j, if we look at the address that we will store to, right, it's going to be the same address, the beginning of that array, for index i equals 0, 1, 2, etc., all the way to offset. Once we end up incrementing uh, the variable j will now store to a new address, out plus one. And right now, depending on the size of cache lines and so on, you might say that, okay, well, it's not out plus one that will cause a cache miss, but maybe out plus four or out plus eight. Whatever it is, uh, the attacker right, can conceivably learn some information about the value of offset just by measuring, again, the, the cache hits and misses. That's not the only problem with this code. Uh, there's another problem in terms of, right, so, so far we've just talked about uh, caches in terms of instruction loading and memory loads and stores, um, but the operations themselves can depend, right, execution time of individual operations can also depend on secrets. So in this case, uh, the increment of J is dependent on a in-mask modulo 2 operation, which on some processor is probably implemented with a division operation, and if we look at the dividend compared to the loop index here, we see that the dividend, uh, this in-range mask, is all zeros, all zeros, until we get to offset, and all of a sudden, uh, this becomes all ones, just as we would hope that the mask works. It's exactly what we intended. Um, but then if you were to look at the processor manual for the x86 processor, for instance, you might look at the division instruction and see that, oh, well, actually, the time that a division takes depends on the most significant bit, uh, the maximum most significant bit of the operands, right? So. Obviously, that, that most significant bit is very different from all zeros to all ones, so we can expect all of a sudden, once we hit it offset, there to be a big difference in timing. So again, the, the people that are writing secure cryptographic implementations, for instance, are, are pretty aware of these kinds of pitfalls and dangers, and there's a whole uh, right, knowledge base out there of things you do to prevent these kinds of attacks. And there's this 
particularly informative list of coding rules that this URL have provided here, which I find pretty interesting. So it, it, it talks about the things I've already talked about. Avoid branching controlled by secret data, for instance. Avoid secret dependent loop bounds. Um, and some more general advice in terms of right, when you're comparing strings, make sure that they are bounded with respect to the, to the secret information. Um, and also to avoid table lookups, which are indexed by secret data, which covers, of course, loads and stores and, and uh, right, get element pointer instructions and LLVM and so on. Um, but what I find particularly interesting in this list of, of rules and insights is that you need to prevent compiler interference for security critical operations. The advice of how do you prevent compiler interference is, well, you look at the assembly code produced and make sure that all the instructions that you expected to be there were there and, you know, no new ones that you didn't expect to be there. So, which means that, right, programming secure code at the C level really requires you to, to be an assembly programmer as well. So we make the argument here that um, this is not a very good state of affairs for programmers and that constant, ensuring constant time is very fragile, right? You can break your algorithm security just by introducing, right, new memory accesses, maybe inadvertently, for instance. Um, it's very optimization dependent. It depends on compiler optimizations. A compiler, right, code that you thought was constant time at the C level can all of a sudden become not constant time at the assembly level. And the compiler is free to do a lot of things. It doesn't, right, it's completely agnostic that you want your program to be constant time. There's no way to tell it that, and it doesn't factor that into its optimizations. Um, it's also, right, this property is very architecture dependent. Right? It depends on the semantics at the machine level of division instructions, for instance. What we're proposing, right, to, to hopefully correct or rectify the state of affairs a little bit is, uh, is that we should do verification. And our approach to verification looks a little bit like this. So we start with an annotated program, right? In reasoning about constant time, uh, the, right, intuitively we have to deal with uh, differentiating secret information from public information. So we'll assume that our program is annotated. The programmer has to say which uh, pieces of memory, which variables are public, information versus what is secret information. So our program will be annotated in that way. And we also have to have a notion of uh, how this program leaks, right? So, so what is it that we're measuring here? How do we account for or abstract this notion of cache misses, cache misses, hits, timing information that attacker could exploit? So we'll also parameterize this verifier by a leakage model. In this case, our leakage model will cover, right, uh, instruction uh, timing, so instruction cache timing by, by assuming that uh, any branch target addresses are leaked by the program. So uh, we, we, we cover the, the memory cache by also saying that uh, loads and stores leak the address that, load, that is loaded or stored to, and division operations leak their uh, maximum operands most significant bits. So with these two inputs, our security verifier that we, we would like to build, uh, should return either secure or there's a violation that your program uh, can, can, uh, is not constant time with respect to this leakage model. So just to get a little bit more precise and formal about what it is that constant time is, what it is that we want to verify, so this looks uh, a bit like non-interference that a lot of you may be familiar with. And it's uh, like most security properties, it's a property over pairs of executions versus uh, usual safety properties that people like me in the verification community are concerned with that are properties over single executions. Here we have to reason about pairs of executions. What this property says is that suppose we have uh, two executions here uh, of a program P with inputs labeled I1 and I2, outputs labeled O1 and O2, and leakage, right, based on the leakage model labeled L1 and L2. What it says is that whenever I execute this program with identical inputs, that is, uh, when the public parts of inputs are identical, the secrets can be different, and identical public outputs, then the leakage has to be identical. So that's the definition that we use of constant time. And we can see what a violation of constant time is here. If we look at public inputs, right, that are identical, the input value in both cases is zero, and we have different secrets. So on the left-hand side, the, the secret is an odd number. On the right-hand side, it's an even number. The program then will compute some function of f, uh, some function f over the input and the secret, uh, and, and release that value as a public output. Now suppose in our example, just for example here, um, that, so we have these identical public input 0, identical public outputs 42, for instance. I don't know how f is implemented. But suppose that the implementation of f, now, right, 
uh, has different cache behavior. So I could have uh, written leakage here in terms of uh, memory addresses or branch addresses. I'm just writing it in terms of cache hits and misses. Um, so this would be a violation because we have, although the same public inputs and outputs, a different sequence of, of cache hits and misses. Right, so to verify uh, a property over pairs of executions, like technically this, we would call this a two safety property versus a one safety property. To verify this, uh, we basically want to reduce it to something we know how to do better, which is safety verification. Uh, that's one safety verification. So the idea would be to have a translator that takes our annotated program and leakage model and gives us another program that is a program that is annotated with assertions that we can pass to a regular safety verifier and in which uh, when the safety verifier says safe, we can conclude that the program is secure. And when the safety verifier says assertion violation, we can conclude that the program has a security violation, in particular a, a violation of the constant time according to our leakage model. Now, uh, there are existing approaches to how do we reason about right, executions, pairs of executions of a given program uh, in terms of single executions of a given program. Well, the, the, the known technique in the literature so far as self-composition. And the idea is basically just to run two copies of the program with right, copies of the entire memory space and so on uh, and, di and, and differentiate the, the, the inputs so that the public parts are equal and the secret parts are not and, and, and compare then if they have the same inputs and same outputs, if I execute one after the other, that the leakage is the same. Right, so this is just a rudimentary diagram of what we're doing, executing one program after the other. And just to illustrate how this would look in a very simple program, because we're designing a translator here, um, right? So I have now this program on the left, which has uh, public input value x, output value y, is branching on the secret and writing to y accordingly. Now the translation that I just described, right? We would create two copies of the entire memory. So in this case, we're just in a simple case where there's just program variables x and y. So we make copies x prime and y prime, and of course secret prime as well. Uh, we assume initially that the public inputs in both executions, x and x prime, are equal. Finally, we, we assume that the public outputs are equal. And then we verify that the leakage of running these two programs. So in the middle, we run the first program over unprimed variables, followed by the same program over primed variables. We verify then that uh, both copies of that program uh, have the same leakage, assuming the public inputs and outputs are equal. So this is already, right, we can convince ourselves pretty easily that this will be a sound and complete method to verify uh, this two safety property that we talked about called constant time. However, this, as I've described it so far, is pretty hard for verifiers to handle. And to see why, let's just consider a, a simple program here. Well, it's not that simple, but it, it does a simple thing. It's computing a Fibonacci uh, sequence. So this is an iterative computation of Fibonacci with variables uh, f, g, and n. And if we just apply our simple translation here, we'll get one copy of the Fibonacci iterative procedure uh, followed by another copy. And we'll have, again, the assumptions and assertions we've put in there for the constant time property. But at the end of the day, what a verifier has to reason about here is, right, the verifier has to come up with invariance to, to prove that this program cannot violate its assertion. What that entails is that the verifier ultimately has to come up with a relation at every point in this program, at every iteration of each loop. How are f and f prime related? Now, I shouldn't have to convince you that uh, this is a hard problem for verifiers. I even uh, would say it's a hard problem for human beings to write down these invariants. <laughs> so given, right, so, so the idea is that that's not very scalable. scalable. It's very hard for uh, verifiers to reason about uh, programs besides right, very simple ones. Um, but there's, there are other approaches to computing these kinds of uh, products of programs that we can consider. And the one we'll start considering here is called cross product. And the idea is instead of executing an entire program one, uh, an entire copy of the program one after the other, the idea is that to, to allow the verifier to be able to reason about the intermediate steps of the program, we'll interleave the steps of the two copies of the programs. So instead of executing the entire copy one followed by entire copy two, we execute the first instruction of the first copy, the first instruction of the second copy, second instruction of the first copy, et cetera, et cetera. We interleave them in lockstep. So what that implies, though, is that the, the control flow of both executions of the program are in sync, right? If I wanted to compute the cross product of this program on the left, the same program again, 
I would have right, just one while loop, where in the while loop we interleave the individual assignments of each copy, and, and just one branch here where, where right, I have x equals 1 followed by x prime equals 1, just how do you expect to interleave those instructions. Um, so the implication is that the, the two copies of the program are following the same control flow. And what that entails is that the soundness of this approach to know that both, that both executions are in fact in sync is that the soundness re relies on us constructing, uh, on proving invariance that those control flow uh, um, decisions are in fact in agreement. So it requires us to come up with invariance. For instance, that the, the, the loop condition is identical for both uh, situations. So the n prime is greater than zero if and only if uh, n is greater than zero. Right, but luckily we're in luck because those invariants are exactly the obligation we have to prove to show that, uh, to uphold the constant path property, which is part of constant time, right? So we need to know anyways that the branch uh, decisions, for instance, weren't made on secrets. And I'm running a little low on time now, so I'll start to gloss over some of the details. But the, the point is that these are invariants that we have to prove anyways, and second of all, they're invariants that uh, the verifier would have an easy time coming up with. The invariants that we need to discharge this particular program are just the equalities between the unprimed and primed variables, which a verification tool could easily just right, throw in there by default as, as an attempt to infer, and that's in fact what our implementation does. On the other hand, this simplistic approach is not quite complete, because if we consider the secure program on the left that does branch on a secret, which is later justified by delimited release of the variable y, um, right, the, 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 the cross-product construction of that will signal a violation because the, the two programs are not in sync. So in fact, our, our overall solution, and again, I'm not going to go into any detail, you can just look at the paper for all these details, uh, will be to, to base our construction on the, the cross-product, which is efficient and scalable, and limit uh, the uh, self-composition to the small parts of the program which actually have to branch on secrets, which are later justified. Quickly, we have an implementation of this, which uh, uses the, the LLVM toolchain and the boogie verifier uh, to conclude uh, uh, security or, or to conclude safety or not of, of the translated program. We implemented our translation in the intermediate language of the boogie verifier. And we have uh, experiments uh, validating our approach on real implementations of several libraries, cryptographic primitives, TLS, fixed point arithmetic, elliptic curve arithmetic. Um, and we verified all of these uh, examples to be correct. And we've also uh, pointed out uh, known flaws in previous versions of these uh, that were not constant time. And right, I don't have time to go into this, but you know, there's been a plethora of related tools uh, as far as we know, our tool is the first to deal with both uh, public and pri the, the differentiation of public inputs and outputs and, so, uh, sorry, of public and, and private inputs and the declassification of outputs and is both sound and complete. And um, a quick word about, uh, right, we're doing all this at the LLVM assembly, whereas initially I talked about there's certain things you'd want to know about process architecture like the specification of whether division instruction uh, takes a constant amount of time or not. So there's some trade-offs here, obviously. Uh, we're, we, in reasoning about LLVM assembly code, we're, we're, we're leveraging some generality. It's not tied to a specific process architecture. And convenience, because there's a lot of nice infrastructure there to leverage. Um, it's also uh, right, partially sound in terms of certain kinds of uh, cache timing attacks, in terms of constant path. Uh, because the optimized LLVM assembly code just before lowering to x86, for instance, will have the same basic block structure and the same basic memory accesses. The difference, of course, will be architecture-specific modeling in terms of uh, how to model right, certain uh, arithmetic instructions and floating-point instructions, etc. So in conclusion, uh, the result that I've talked about today is how to verify the constant time property uh, using selective self-composition and then just off-the-shelf verification tools a simple prototype that we've implemented and showed effective for uh, existing secure constant time C code implementations and right, with the basic limitation of architecture specific modeling. So thank you. All right, questions? Come on, somebody has a question. Yeah, there we go. 
just roll back. Sorry. If you could please roll back to your slide where you had, yeah, that one. Uh, how was your experience using the SMAC toolkit? Uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to understand here is the implementation is typically done in C uh, for all these cryptographic functions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and somehow SMAC converts that into an intermediate language that can be digested by Boogie. Yes. Uh, so how was your experience with SMAC and its conversion process? Because my personal sort of feeling on that is it's a hit or miss. Uh -huh. So I'm actually uh, one of the co-authors of the SMAC, so I have a lot of experience with that. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically, right, we, 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 make, we make a best effort translation of translating uh, the LLVM's intermediate language to Boogie's intermediate language. Um, it's not perfect, but we have covered uh, most of the bases. So the basic translation for, I, mean, I don't know if you're worried about specific features, but just to give you a flavor. So uh, initially, right, we have just a translation that translates uh, uh, unsigned integers and all these things just into mathematical integers. Now we also have something you could do that is more precise that you can actually model those as 32-bit vectors, for instance. Um, um, We've found that, I mean, for the, for the code that we analyze, uh, it covers all of the bases we need to be covered, but I mean, there's always features that we don't implement, and we're, we kind of do this on an on-demand basis. Yeah. Questions? All right, well, I have maybe like one or two questions. So uh, you rely on a leakage model to have a slightly more flexible system. Uh, how did you get this model, and like, what does that look like? Ah. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, the le right, ideally the leakage model would be a parameter here. In this case, we've just fixed a leakage model. But the idea was just that um, if, maybe go back to the, to the example. So for instance here, right, if, if the problem is uh, whether two program paths go down different branches, two, two executions go down different branches depending on secrets, the way we would uh, just set up the leakage there is we would witness that they've gone down different paths because what they're leaking is the address that they jump that they branch to right so in, in branch instructions we say that it leaks the branched address so that when two different executions diverge we have a, a witness of their divergence meaning the the branch address and the same for memory addresses and so on sorry i, mean, I meant more like instru instru for instructions but uh I, I i guess for that like you estimate as sorry well. I meant more for like instructions, right? Like if I have uh, so like... If, right, for instructions, I mean, for individual instructions, uh, that's actually one of the limitations, right? So we're not modeling the leakage of any specific processor. Um, that's something you'd have to do, right? If you really wanted to know that your code is constant time on x86 and you wanted to verify for x86, you'd have to go to the... I mean, the best approach I know now is to go to the processor right, manual and in, in, in read whether the, the, the execution time of an instruction depends on operands and so on. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah, Deepak. So in this hybrid construction um, or this hybrid product, at some point you must know um, which control flow points are actually secret dependent and which are not. Is that correct or did I get this wrong? That is correct, yeah. So what we've done right now, it, it, most of the code that we've analyzed in those libraries uh, never needs this. Um, okay. But there are one or two examples that do. And in that case, we have just gone in and identified manually what are those control points which do depend right, on, on later declassification. Um, I see. In general, you could do right, an approach which automatically uh, tries the, 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 the proof with just the cross product, if it doesn't work, then try to identify right, where these divergences are and so on. So maybe there's some SIGAR kind of loop you can do there to, to have more automation. At the moment, we're just doing it manually. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Sujia from Georgia Tech. Uh, so I'm curious about how do you get the loop invariant? Because you know, in general, verification is very hard to derive those uh, loop environment. But here, clearly the user doesn't uh, give such information, right? So generating these invariants that I was talking about here? Yes. Yeah, yeah so uh, in this case, our, our tool just blindly, so our, our tool is aware, uh, right? Our, our translation is duplicating all, essentially all of the program variables of the program into 
unprimed and primed versions. Mm -hmm. And our tool uh, basically does some analysis to see which variables are live in, in every given program point and so on. And just at all of those, so at every loop head, uh, where it looks at the set of variables that are live and in use, uh, and, and outputs this invariant, f equals f prime, for every such variable. Uh. In practice, this just works. Um, there have been one or two, I think, contrived examples where we've had to uh, delete one of those invariants mm -hmm. because it actually wasn't an invariant. But in most cases, it works. I, I don't have a good answer for you in terms of future automation for this to be right complete. But uh, okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, another question I have is, as you mentioned at the beginning, say writing the time constant code is, is hard, extremely hard. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, uh, I mean, we gave a piece of code which may be not constant time program, but uh, in the end we just produce a piece of code which equivalent, or functionally equivalent to the original code by the constant programming. Uh, so I'm not sure I understood your question. Uh, what I'm saying is, because here the piece of work say, we can verify whether the code is constant time program, right? Right. Uh, what do you think we just automatically generate such kind of program? I mean, given an input which may not constant time program. So what it, mm. I didn't understand the what if still. Let's take this offline. Okay. And okay. Oh, thanks. Okay. Mm. okay. Thanks. Let's take them again. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>